The Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance by Elliot O'Donnell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance by Elliot O'Donnell. Twenty pounds a year for a twelve-roomed house, with large front lawn, good stabling, and big kitchen gardens. That sounds all right, I commented. But why so cheap? Well, the advertiser, Mr. Baldwin by name, a short, stout gentleman, with keen, glittering eyes, replied, Well, you see, it's a bit of a distance from the town, and, er, most people prefer being nearer like neighbors and all that sort of thing like neighbors i exclaimed i don't i've just seen about enough of them drains all right oh yes perfect water excellent everything in good condition first rate loneliness the only thing that people object to that is so then i'll oblige you to send someone to show me over the house, for I think it is just the sort of place we want. You see, after being bottled up in a theater all the afternoon and evening, one likes to get away somewhere where it is quiet, somewhere where one can lie in bed in the morning, inhaling pure air and undisturbed by street traffic. I understand, Mr. Baldwin responded. But, er, it is rather late now. Wouldn't you prefer to see it over in the morning? Everything looks at its worst, its very worst, in the twilight. Oh, I'll make allowances for the dusk, I said. You haven't got any ghosts stowed away there, have you? And he went off into a roar of laughter. <laughs> no, the house is not haunted, Mr. Baldwin replied. Not that it would much matter to you if it were, for I can see you don't believe in spooks. Believe in spooks? I cried. Not much. I would as soon believe in patent hair restorers. Let me see it over at once. Very well, sir. I'll take you there myself, Mr. Baldwin replied, somewhat reluctantly. Here, Tim, fetch the keys of the crow's nest and tell Higgins to bring the trap round. The boy he addressed flew, and in a few minutes the sound of wheels and the jingling of harness announced the vehicle was at the door. Ten minutes later, and I and my escort were bowling merrily over the ground in the direction of the crow's nest. It was early autumn, and the cool evening air, fragrant with the mellowness of the luscious Virginian pippin, was tinged also with the sadness inseparable from the demise of a long and glorious summer. Evidences of decay and death were everywhere, in the brown fallen leaves of the oaks and elms, in the bare and denuded ditches. Here, a giant mill-wheel, half immersed in a dark still pool, stood idle and silent. There, a hovel, but recently inhabited by hop-pickers, was now tenantless, its glassless windows boarded over, and a wealth of death and rotting vegetable matter in thick profusion over the tiny path and the single stone doorstep. Is it always as quiet and deserted as this? I asked of my companion, who continually cracked his whip, as if he liked to hear the reverberations of its echoes. Always, was the reply, and sometimes more so. You ain't used to the country. Not very. I want to try it by way of a change. Are you well versed in the cry of birds? What was that? We were fast approaching an exceedingly gloomy bit of the road where there were plantations on each side, and the trees united their fantastically forked branches overhead. I thought I had never seen so dismal-looking a spot, and a sudden lowering of the temperature made me draw my overcoat tighter round me. That? Oh, a nightbird of some sort, Mr. Baldwin replied. An ugly sound, wasn't it? Beastly things. I can't imagine why they were created. Whoa! Steady there, steady. The horse reared as he spoke, 
and taking a violent plunge forward, set off at a wild gallop. A moment later, and I uttered an exclamation of astonishment. Keeping pace with us, although apparently not moving at more than an ordinary walking pace, was a man of medium height, dressed in a Panama hat and Albert coat. He had a thin aquiline nose, a rather pronounced chin, was clean-shaven, and had a startlingly white complexion. By the side of him trotted two poodles, whose close-cropped skins showed out with remarkable perspicuity. "'Who the deuce is he?' I asked, raising my voice to a shout, on account of the loud clatter made by the horse's hoofs and the wheels. "'Who? What?' Mr. Baldwin shouted in return. "'Why, the man walking along with us.' "'Man? I can't see no man,' Mr. Baldwin growled. I looked at him curiously. It may, of course, have been due to the terrific speed we were going, to the difficulty of holding in the horse, but his cheeks were ashy pale and his teeth chattered. "'Do you mean to say,' I cried, "'that you can see no figure walking on my side of the horse and actually keeping pace with it?' "'Of course I can't,' Mr. Baldwin snapped. "'It's an hallucination, caused by the moonlight through the branches overhead. I've experienced it more than once.' "'Then why don't you have it now?' I queried. "'Don't ask so many questions, please,' Mr. Baldwin shouted. "'Don't you see it is as much as I can do to hold the brute in? Heaven preserve us! We were nearly over that time!' The trap rose high in the air as he spoke and then dropped with such a jolt that I was nearly thrown off, and only saved myself by the skin of my teeth. A few yards more the spinney ceased, and we were away out in the open country, plunging and galloping as if our very souls depended on it. From all sides, queer and fantastic shadows of objects, which certainly had no material counterparts in the moon, kissed sward of the rich, ripe meadows, rose to greet us, and filled the lane with their black-and-white wavering, ethereal forms. The evening was one of wonders, for which I had no name, wonders associated with an iciness that was far from agreeable. I was not at all sure which I liked best, the black, stygian, tree-lined part of the road we had just left, or the wide ocean of brilliant moonbeams and street suggestions. The figures of the man and the dogs were equally vivid in each. Though I could no longer doubt they were nothing mortal, they were altogether unlike what I had imagined ghosts. Like the generality of people who are psychic, and who have never had an experience of the superphysical, my conception of a phantasm was a thing in white that made ridiculous groanings and still more ridiculous clankings of chains. But here was something different, something that looked, save perhaps for the excessive pallor of its cheeks, just like an ordinary man. I knew it was not a man, partly on account of its extraordinary performance. No man, even if running at full speed, could keep up with us like that, partly on account of the unusual nature of the atmosphere, which was altogether indefinable, it brought with it, and also because of my own sensations my intense horror, which could not, I felt certain, have been generated by anything physical. I cogitated all this in my mind as I gazed at the figure, and in order to make sure it was no hallucination, I shut first one eye and then the other, covering them alternately with the palm of my hand. The figure, however, was still there, still pacing along at our side with the regular swing, swing of the born walker. We kept on in this fashion till we arrived at a rusty iron gate leading, by means of a weed-covered path, to a low, two-story white house. Here the figures left us, and, as it seemed to me, vanished at the foot of the garden wall. "'This is the house,' Mr. Baldwin panted, pulling up with the greatest difficulty, the horse evincing obvious antipathy to the iron gate. "'And these are the keys.' I'm afraid you must go in alone, as I dare not leave the animal even for a minute. Oh, all right, I said. 
I don't mind, now that the ghost, or whatever you like to call it, has gone, I'm myself again. I jumped down, and, threading my way through the bramble-entangled path, reached the front door. On opening it, I hesitated. The big, old-fashioned hall, with the great frowning staircase leading to the gallery overhead, the many open doors, showing naught but bare, deserted boards within, the grim passages, all moonlit and peopled only with queer, flickering shadows, suggested much that was terrifying. I fancied I heard noises, noises like stealthy footsteps moving from room to room, and tiptoeing along the passages and down the staircase. Once my heart almost stopped beating as I saw what, at first, I took to be a white face peering at me from a far recess, but which I eventually discovered was only a daub of whitewash, and, once again, my hair all but rose on end when one of the doors at which I was looking swung open and something came forth. Oh, the horror of that moment! As long as I live, I shall never forget it. The something was a cat, just a rather lean but otherwise material black tom. Yet, in the state my nerves were then, it created almost as much horror as if it had been a ghost. Of course, it was the figure of the walking man that was the cause of all this nervousness. Had it not appeared to me, I should doubtless have entered the house with the utmost sang-froid. My mind sat on nothing but the condition of the walls, drains, etc. As it was, I held back, and it was only after a severe mental struggle I summoned up the courage to leave the doorway and explore. Cautiously, very cautiously, with my heart in my mouth, I moved from room to room, halting every now and then in dreadful suspense as the wind, sowing through across the open land behind the house, blew down the chimneys and set the window frames jarring. At the commencement of one of the passages, I was immeasurably startled to see a dark shape poke forward and then spring hurriedly back, and was so frightened that I dared not advance to see what it was. Moment after moment sped by, and I still stood there, the cold sweat oozing out all over me, and my eyes fixed in hideous expectation on the blank wall. What was it? What was hiding there? Would it spring out on me if I went to see? At last, urged on by a fascination I found impossible to resist, I crept down the passage, my heart throbbing painfully, and my whole being overcome with the most sickly anticipations. As I drew nearer to the spot, it was as much as I could do to breathe, and my respiration came in quick jerks and gasps. Six, five, four, two feet, and I was at the dreaded angle. Another step, taken after the most prodigious battle, and nothing sprang out on me. I was confronted only with a large piece of paper that had come loose from the wall, and flapped backwards and forwards each time the breeze from without rustled past it. The reaction, after such an agony of suspense, was so great that I leaned against the wall and laughed till I cried. A noise, from somewhere away in the basement, calling me to myself, I went downstairs and investigated. Again a shock, this time more sudden, more acute. Pressed against the window pane of one of the front reception rooms was the face of a man, with corpse-like cheeks and pale, malevolent eyes. I was petrified. Every drop of my blood was congealed. My tongue glued to my mouth. My arms hung helpless. I stood in the doorway and stared at it. This went on for what seemed to me an eternity. Then came a revelation. The face was not that of a ghost, but of Mr. Baldwin, who, getting alarmed at my long absence, had come to look for me. We left the premises together. All the way back to the town, I thought, should I, or should I not, take the house? Seen as I had seen it, it was a ghoulish-looking place, as weird as Paris catacomb, but then daylight makes all the difference. Viewed in the sunshine, it would be just like any other house, plain bricks and mortar. 
I liked the situation. It was just far enough away from town to enable me to escape all the smoke and traffic, and near enough to make shopping easy. The only obstacles were the shadows, the strange, enigmatical shadows I had seen in the hall and passages, and the figure of the walker. Dare I take a house that knew such visitors? At first I said no, and then yes. Something, I could not tell what, urged me to say yes. I felt that a very grave issue was at stake, that of a great wrong connected in some manner with a mysterious figure awaited writing, and that the hand of fate pointed at me as the one and only person who could do it. "'Are you sure the house isn't haunted?' I demanded, as we slowly rolled away from the iron gate, and I leaned back in my seat to light my pipe. "'Haunted?' Mr. Baldwin scoffed. "'Why, I thought you didn't believe in ghosts. Laughed at them.' "'No more I do believe in them,' I retorted. "'But I have children, and we know how imaginative children are. "'I can't undertake to stop their imaginations.' No, but you can tell me whether anyone else has imagined anything there. Imagination is sometimes very infectious. As far as I know, then, no. Leastways, I have not heard tell of it. Who was the last tenant? Mr. Jeremiah Dance. Why did he leave? How do I know? Got tired of being there, I suppose. How long was he there? Nearly three years. Where is he now? That's more than I can say. Why do you wish to know? Why, I repeated, because it is more satisfactory to me to hear about the house from someone who has lived in it. Has he left no address? Not that I know of, and it's more than two years since he was here. What? The house has been empty all that time? Two years is not very long. Houses, even town houses, are frequently unoccupied for longer than that. I think you'll like it. I did not speak again till the drive was over, and we drew up outside the landlord's house. I then said, Let me have an agreement. I've made up my mind to take it. Three years and the option to stay on. That was just like me. Whatever I did, I did on the spur of the moment, a mode of procedure that often led me into difficulties. A month later, and my wife, children, servants, and I were all ensconced in the crow's nest. That was the beginning of October. Well, the month passed by, and November was fairly in before anything remarkable happened. It then came about in this fashion. Jenny, my eldest child, a self-willed and rather bad-tempered girl of about twelve, evading the vigilance of her mother, who had forbidden her to go out as she had a cold, ran to the gate one evening to see if I was anywhere in sight. Though barely five o'clock, the moon was high in the sky, and the shadows of the big trees had already commenced their gambols along the roadside. Jenny clambered up the gate, as children do, and peering over, suddenly espied what she took to be me, striding towards the house at a swinging pace, and followed by two poodles. Papa, she cried, how cute of you, only to think of you bringing home two doggies. Oh, Papa, naughty Papa, what will Mum say? And climbing over into the lane, imminent danger to life and limb, she tore frantically towards the figure. To her dismay, however, it was not me, but a stranger with a horribly white face and big glassy eyes, which he turned down on her and stared. She was so frightened that she fainted, and some ten minutes later I found her lying out there on the road. From the description she gave me of the man and dogs, I felt quite certain they were the figures I had seen though I pretended the man was a tramp, and assured her she would never see him again. A week passed, and I was beginning to hope nothing would happen, when one of the servants gave notice to leave. At first she would not say why she did not like the house, but when pressed 
made the following statement. It's haunted, Mrs. B. I can put up with mice and beetles, but not with ghosts. I've had a queer sensation, as if water was following down my spine ever since I've been here, but never saw anything till last night. I was then in the kitchen getting ready to go to bed. Jane and Emma had already gone up, and I was preparing to follow them, when, all of a sudden, I heard footsteps, quick and heavy, cross the gravel and approach the window. The boss, says I to myself, maybe he's forgot the key and can't get in at the front door. Well, I went to the window and was about to throw it open when I got an awful shock. Pressed against the glass, looking in at me, was a face. Not the boss's face, not the face of anyone living, but a horrid white thing with a drooping mouth and wide-open glassy eyes that had no more expression in them than a pig. As sure as I'm standing here, Mrs. B., it was the face of a corpse, the face of a man that had died no natural death, and by its side, standing on their hind legs, and staring in at me, too, were two dogs, both poodles, also no living things, but dead, horribly dead. Well, they stared at me, all three of them, for perhaps a minute, certainly not less, and then vanished. That's why I'm leaving, Mrs. B. My heart was never overstrong. I always suffered with palpitations, and if I saw those heads again, it would kill me. After this, my wife spoke to me seriously. Jack, she said, are you sure there's nothing in it? I don't think Mary would leave us without a good cause, and the description of what she saw tallies exactly with the figure that frightened Jenny. <coughs> Jenny assures me she never said a word about it to the servants. They can't both have imagined it. I did not know what to say. My conscience pricked me. Without a doubt, I ought to have told my wife of my own experience in the lane, and have consulted her before taking the house. Supposing she, or any of the children, should die of fright, it would be my fault. I should never forgive myself. "'You've something on your mind. What is it?' my wife demanded. I hesitated a moment or two, and then told her. The next quarter of an hour was one I do not care to recollect, but when it was over, and she had had her say, it was decided I should make inquiries, and see if there was any possible way of getting rid of the ghosts. With this end in view, I drove to the town, and after several fruitless efforts, was at length introduced to a Mr. Marsden, clerk of one of the banks, who, in reply to my questions, said, "'Well, Mr. B., it's just this way. I do know something, only, in a small place like this, one has to be so extra careful what one says. Some years ago, a Mr. Jeremiah Dance occupied the crow's nest. He came here, apparently, a total stranger, and though often in the town, was only seen in the company of one person, his landlord, Mr. Baldwin, with whom, if local gossip is to be relied on, he appeared to be on terms of the greatest familiarity. Indeed, they were seldom apart, walked about the lanes arm in arm, visited each other's houses on alternate evenings, called each other Teddy and Leslie. This state of things continued for nearly three years, and then people suddenly began to comment on the fact that Mr. Dance had gone, or at least was no longer visible. And Aaron Boy, returning back to town late one evening, swore to being passed on the way by a trap containing Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Dance, who were speaking in very loud voices, just as if they were having a violent altercation. On reaching that part of the road where the trees are thickest overhead, the lad overtook them, or rather Mr. Baldwin, preparing to mount into the trap. Mr. Dance was nowhere to be seen. And from that day to this, nothing has ever been heard of him. As none of his friends or relations came forward to raise inquiries, and all his bills were paid, several of them by Mr. Baldwin, no one took the matter up. Mr. Baldwin pooh-poohed the errand boy's story, and declared that, 
on the night in question he had been alone in an altogether different part of the county and knew nothing whatever of mr dance's movements further than that he had recently announced his intention of leaving the crow's nest before the expiration of the three years lease he had not the remotest idea where he was he claimed the furniture in payment of the rent due to him did the matter end there i asked in one sense of the word yes in another no within a few weeks of dance's disappearance rumors got afloat that his ghost had been seen on the road just where you may say you saw it as a matter of fact i've seen it myself and so have crowds of other people has anyone ever spoken to it yes and it has vanished at once i went there one night with the purpose of laying it but on its appearing suddenly i confess i was so startled that i had not only forgot what i rehearsed to say but ran home without uttering as much as a word and what are your deductions of the case the same as everyone else's mr marsden whispered only like everyone else i dare not say had mr dance any dogs yes two poodles of which much to mr baldwin's annoyance everyone noticed this he used to make the most ridiculous fuss humph i observed that settles it ghosts and to think i never believed in them before well i am going to try try what mr marsden said a note of alarm in his voice try laying it i have an idea i may succeed i wish you luck then may i come with you thanks no i rejoined i would rather go there alone i said this in a well-lighted room with the hum of a crowded thoroughfare in my ears twenty minutes later when i had left all that behind and was fast approaching the darkest part of an exceptionally dark road i wished i had not at the very spot where i had previously seen the figures i saw them now they suddenly appeared by my side and though i was going at a great rate for the horse took fright they kept easy pace with me twice i essayed to speak to them but could not ejaculate a syllable through sheer horror and it was only by nerving myself to the utmost and forcing my eyes away from them that i was able to stick to my seat and hold on to the reins on and on we dashed until trees road sky universe were obliterated in one blinding whirlwind that got up my nostrils choked my ears and deadened me to everything save the all terrorizing instinctive knowledge that the figures by my side were still there stalking along as quietly and leisurely as if the horse had been going at a snail's pace at last to my intense relief for never had the ride seemed longer i reached the crow's nest and as i hurriedly dismounted from the trap the figure shot past me and vanished once inside the house and in the bosom of my family where all was light and laughter courage returned and i upbraided myself bitterly for this cowardice i confessed to my wife and she insisted on accompanying me the following afternoon at twilight to the spot where the ghost appeared to originate to our intense dismay we had not been there more than three or four minutes before dora our youngest girl a pretty sweet-tempered child of eight came running up to us with a telegram which one of the servants had asked her to give us my wife snatching it from her and reading it was about to scold her severely when she suddenly paused and clutching hold of the child with one hand pointed hysterically at something on one side of her with the other i looked and dora looked and we both saw standing erect and staring at us the spare figure of a man with a ghastly white face and dull lifeless eyes clad in a panama hat albert coat and small patent leather boots beside him were two glossy abnormally glossy poodles i tried to speak but as before 
was too frightened to articulate a sound, and my wife was in the same plight. With Dora, however, it was otherwise, and she electrified us by going up to the figure and exclaiming, "'Who are you? You must be very ill to look so white. Tell me your name.' The figure made no reply, but gliding slowly forward, moved up to a large isolated oak, and pointing with the index finger of its left hand at the trunk of the tree, seemingly sank into the earth and vanished from view. For some seconds everyone was silent, and then my wife exclaimed, "'Jack, I shouldn't wonder if Dora hasn't been the means of solving the mystery. Examine the tree closely.' I did so. The tree was hollow, and inside it were three skeletons. End of The Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance